या लाउड एंड कल ओ आई एम सो सॉरी गाइस आई मीन ऑलमोस्ट 10 मिनट्स डिले आई मीन दिस इज माय फर्स्ट टाइम विद दिस स्पेस नॉट वेरी सॉरी नॉट not a problem not a problem it happened uh, with one of our guests previously as well i was not aware otherwise i would have informed you uh, initially as well okay right so guys uh, without wasting any further time uh, we have uh, ikansh uh, Mid- mithal with us he is a registered research analyst and uh, founder of uh, catalyst wealth uh, since its inception in the year 2011 he is a btech graduate in electronics and communication uh so the good thing about uh, his experience is like he comes uh, from a family of investors which has provided him with the necessary exposure to start investing at a very tender or young age which has uh, led to him developing passion for investing so primarily he enjoys digging the small and mid cap companies where potential and opportunity size is large or he has been uh, like recognized by forbes and et for his equity prowess so again uh, we don't want to miss the opportunity to uh, get the maximum benefit from his experience so feel free to ask your questions uh, i'll be i'll be uh, informing you guys uh, regarding when we'll be opening the forum for questions so to start with uh, welcome uh, ikansh and uh, i'll be asking questions initially and then we move on to the attendees so if they have any question they will ask sure sure prince okay great so so uh, how it started for you like you were telling you belong to a family of investors so at what age it started for you and how it developed uh, you developed interest and i mean started your journey so at a so young age so yeah i i have been like lucky enough uh, because i mean my father was a member of up stock exchange so he was a stock broker there and we had this equity investment culture in our in our family so he wasn't much into trading uh, and he used to invest again for long term and luckily like i mean we used to have these annual reports of companies i mean like cipla dr reddies and all he had invested in and luckily i had seen those companies or i mean the value of those companies grow significantly over over like few years so whenever there used to be like family gathering or i mean some friends or even like at dinner table and all there used to be discussions around stock market or how it has created wealth uh, for my father in certain stocks which he had held for like many years so uh, my exposure to the stock market started quite early and for me personally like in in terms of my own investment journey in terms of starting my own dmat account and then investing uh, being even with very smaller amounts so i think in probably towards the late end of my third year of btech i think it was 2008 the markets had crashed and uh, since i mean i was exposed to the market to a certain extent so i knew okay i mean these kind of corrections happen and normally these tend to provide good opportunity so i just went to this ifl uh, uh, thing and opened my dmat account probably in november 2008 i had very small sums of money 1000 to 1000 odd rupees but uh, i i was already kind of uh, looking and researching stocks uh, because uh, when i joined btech i mean frankly i did not enjoy it much so i mean in my uh, free time i used to go to the library and read certain investment books read economic times and had already like started uh, researching on stocks very smaller companies so i had done my research at least i thought i had done my research and when the market crashed i thought it's a good opportunity no matter how small the amount be so i opened my dmat account and probably i started with 4k or 5000 kind of investment so i was getting some money because i mean to uh, to meet my expenses while while in college and i could save something out of it so i, uh, I started with 4000 5000 when i was probably 20 21 years old so that ha- that's how it started for me Okay, great, great. So, Ikansh, uh, what is uh, central to uh, your investing process? So, what kind of framework you follow before zeroing in on any investment? So, see, framework is something that has evolved over a period of time. I mean, uh, when I started, I simply used to look at, 
i mean normally you would have read books like intelligent investor or some other a bit of security analysis and since i did not have a financial background i had read uh, certain books based on uh, uh, cash flows balance sheet income statement and all so when you start you you look at very basic metrics like pe eps and all and some growth all those things and it keeps on evolving so as you keep making investments you gain some you lose some and then you and there is then there is so much stuff on the internet so over the years it has kind of evolved so right now if i look at it uh, in my investing framework i kind of have three buckets uh, that i have uh, in my mind there are three buckets of stocks that i look at so one is very simple which is growth at reasonable valuations so i mean here and i am looking at companies so first of all i would like to add here is that i primarily invest in small and mid cap stocks so this is a space which is not uh, i mean wherein people are not extremely not much research happens here although it has started happening over the last few years but yeah there are a lot of stocks which remain ignored uh, these are these could be 100 200 300 500 odd crore market cap companies so a lot of times you are able to get very good companies which have been reporting good growth year on year with sound balance sheets not much equity dilution high promoter holding and you are still able to get at very reasonable valuations 8 10 times earnings obviously you need to understand the business you need to determine what could be the tailwinds what is the opportunity size so all those things are accounted for so this is a kind of a simple thing wherein you look for growth at reasonable valuations i am i am i am i am unable to pay like say 30 40 times earnings somehow i am to attune that way that i'm unable to when i'm at, at least starting to make an investment in a stock i'm not able to make uh, investments at very high valuations i mean whatever you could say in terms of pe or whatever so i'm unable to make so i look for those growth at reasonable valuation kind of segments the second one is i mean i recently over the last 4 5 years i've started looking at cyclical stocks so earlier i used to ignore these stocks i mean there was this general thing that okay cyclical segments cyclical stocks these are bad uh, these are bad investment opportunities eventually over longer term they don't create much wealth but when you look at patterns when you uh, start looking at numbers and when you start looking at how the stock prices have reacted so i noticed a pattern that these could be good opportunities for investment not necessarily for very long term but yeah over a cycle of 2 3 years over a period of 2 3 years you could make decent money sometimes even like 3x 4x in a period of 2 3 years or even more so this is a second segment that i look at uh, cyclical stocks and here um, the focus is to look at companies uh, where the balance sheet is in general good but currently the company is facing bad earnings so for instance you could have metal stocks like right now in my view they are going through a very good uh, phase of earnings because all the prices are the metal prices had risen so much that there was good demand but if you just look at say 2 years back the earnings for most of these companies in metal space be it ferro chrome alloy steel they had very bad earnings i uh, take for instance aluminum the prices were almost like uh, 10 odd years low for aluminum if you if you could look at L- lme aluminum prices so i try and look at look for those opportunities where the earnings are really bad right now i mean probably sometimes losses as well but if, if i see good balance sheet i generally take a position that way and this could happen for other sectors as well be it paper or other segments and the third bucket that i look at is good companies going through a temporary bad phase so for instance there could be an auto ancillary stock there was good good demand for auto ancillary till say 2018 and they, those all were doing really good but 2019 20 turned out to be really bad the demand collapsed the earnings kind of went down but you still had these companies which were which were overall quite good they they, they are supplier to oems they they have had a good track record and they have been doing well but currently because the demand has collapsed their earnings uh, have gone down their margins have collapsed and you and the, even the stock price has taken a beating like 50 60% kind of down so you look at these overall i mean which could be moderately cyclical as well so or say for instance api companies like right now probably in my view they had a good run up till 2020 21 because of shortage of api and pharma stuff but now they are going through a bad phase because Uh, the raw material prices have shot up so much there was a uh, stocking overstocking of products and now there's a fall in demand but the, there are certain good companies in this space and now the stocks have taken a beating 50 60 odd percent so good companies are going through bad phases the third bucket that i look at 
Uh, right, Akansh. So, like, uh, before coming to the three buckets you uh, told us, so what are the screening criteria? I mean, how to pick the ideas? Uh, how you go about it? So, like, for uh, good companies uh, and reasonable valuations, the screening criteria are, are, like, very basic. I mean, I frankly tend to have slightly... Uh, wider screening criteria in terms of not being very narrow because then you are unable to get many companies to even look at so it could be normal like i mean year on year growth like say uh, uh, five year cagr greater than 10 percent promoter holding greater than 40 percent market cap say greater than 100 crore uh, debt to equity say less than one so I would have very basic open criteria uh, when I'm looking at growth at reasonable valuations because this then throws up, say, 100 stocks on screener, right? And then uh, because this is my full-time kind of a thing, I'm able to I look at a lot of companies. I mean, all these 100 companies I would, I would look at. There would be some companies wherein you just open it, you look at a few figures and you think, okay, this is not the space to go in and you simply don't further look at the stock. But... Uh, when you have such wide criteria, it allows you to like explore more and research more. So as Peter Lynch used to say, the more the number of rocks you turn, I mean, the better the opportunity you could probably get. So, and for say good companies going through bad phase. So what I do is I, I, uh, the, the major criteria that I put in is uh, current year operating margins less than average of five year operating margins. So the idea is that currently the company might be going through some bad phase. So, the, for instance, if the five-year EBITDA margin for the company is 15%, but if, say, currently it's 10, 11%, and it could be because of various things. I mean, the raw material prices may have shot up and the company may not have been able to pass it on. Or there has been a shrinkage in demand and there's been a, a slowdown in earnings while the other operating expenses of the company have uh, grown. So, this is the major criteria when I'm looking at for a company's, a good companies going through bad phase, while the other criteria remain same, like... Uh, again, I would keep it a bit wider so as to have uh, an opportunity to look at more companies. So again, uh, the basic criteria would still be same, like promoter holding more than 40 odd percent, dividend yield greater than zero, five years CAGR growth greater than seven, eight percent. So one could always uh, work with these metrics, I mean, to keep it as narrow as possible or as wide as possible. But I like to keep these metrics wider so that I get uh, I could look at more opportunities. Another thing that I look at is capacity expansion. So, the, uh, so one of the major criteria for this could be like uh, this year fixed assets greater than 1.5 times three uh, fixed assets, which were three years back. So the idea is to look at companies which have made major investments in fixed assets. So normally, what happens is that companies go on this expansion free. They put up capex. But a lot of times what happens is that there are teething issues in the beginning. The companies aren't able to scale up. So now while the CAPEX, the, uh, the plant has been commercialized, initial capacity utilization could be lower. But at the same time, the other expenses have started increasing because the company has put up the entire infrastructure. The interest cost starts increasing. The depreciation cost starts increasing. And what happens is that company's earnings again collapse in the, uh, in the short term. So now... Uh, you you could look if you do more analysis you would get probably get an opportunity where the earnings have collapsed in the shorter term but eventually they could improve going forward as the capacity utilization or the demand for the company improves and therein you could get several combination of factors like in higher sales growth improvement in operating margins as the uh, c company starts using its plan reduction in debt with the cash flows that happen so so these are the kind of criteria that I put in for screening of stocks. Uh, right, Ekansh. So Ekansh, uh, when I mean in today's time, there is information overload. So how to uh, cut on the noise uh, around? Because uh, you get so many ideas uh, on daily basis. Maybe I mean this is happening with most of us who are on social media. So how to cut short uh, the ideas and concentrate on a number of ideas only? So I think one has to determine his or her uh, sources from where one is looking at ideas. So if you are doing your own research, 
I mean, you could get your ideas from, say, I mean, by screening of stocks on screener or other tools. Similarly, you could be going through corporate announcements, and you would, if if you have been doing your research, you would have set up certain criteria or you would have a certain thought process, and based on that, you would be looking for stock ideas. I think otherwise, if one is just simply looking for stock ideas based on what is being shared on social media, I think that's not not the way to go. Unless you have very trusted sources or wherein you 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 kind of okay know the guy or know his thought process and you would also know when he is actually taking the decision of selling because just knowing the stock idea even from say a renowned investor or famous investor or celebrity investor doesn't help until you know what's the thought process and until you know when exactly the exit is going to happen so just simply i think this should be completely avoided in general uh like n- uh, simply following or getting too much information in terms of just getting the stock ideas either you should be doing your own research full time or you should have either you should be following a certain you should consult your investment advi- advisor that way but you should not be taking these random stock idea strips from social media or, or or tv or or these or these business channels that way i mean that's not the way to go you would be better uh, right. of investing in mutual funds all right So Janak, in between, if you have any question, you can ask. Then I'll go over here. No, no, Prince. Uh, please carry on. I'll uh, okay, okay. definitely. So right, right. So I can't say like uh, you. You were telling about the small cap space. So what kind of challenges? Uh, I mean, if not now, initially you used to face uh, while analyzing the small cap company. so uh, i think the major challenge has always been and even now it remains although it has reduced to a certain is extent is the availability of information in such companies so i mean uh, you could find good companies you will find a lot of great data in terms of their numbers but uh, but when you go through their annual reports you wouldn't find much in fact in a lot of companies they have started improving their annual reports Uh, in the past few years but earlier say 10 years back i mean the annual reports did not have much information and now you have these con calls and investor presentations earlier this wasn't even there at all so and the one opportunity you could get was uh, by meeting the management at the agm and and get some idea and hang of it so uh, yeah getting information is challenging but i think uh, it's how you see it i mean I'll, uh, a lot of times i think as a lot of good investors or businessmen say that you tend to yeah you can take decisions even when you don't have complete information or like i mean there's a 70% information is available so a lot of times i have invested in stocks wherein i mean just the numbers have been too good so there has been say year on year growth and by year on year growth i mean year on year growth not in terms of cgr over 5 years but consecutive year on year year growth consecutive improvement in i mean or maintenance of margins or consecutive improvement in pat while maintaining good balance sheet or say even time uh, even reducing debt and and the promoter holding being good and if you are sometimes in small caps you are even able to get those stocks at 8 10 times earnings so i have taken inv- investment decisions even on the basis of that and then once you have made uh, investments uh, you tend to research more you or or a period of holding one or two years you tend to get more information so getting information has been challenging although that space is improving because a lot of companies have started doing presentations and they are a bit reachable now also one could what one could do is what i have started doing over the last many years is after i have taken a position i write to the company uh, with my set of queries and frankly i have seen that a lot of times those queries get answered so if one takes that step one could get some hold of information which may not be easily available to others Uh, right so i can't share. let me ask you a very pertinent thing like what uh, where did you devise the idea of this name catalyst wealth and what was the idea behind uh, this uh, i mean your uh, startup yeah so i mean frankly uh, i started this in 2011 uh, probably just one year after completing my btech so i had always been focused on investing i mean long term investing i i probably knew in my mind that a lot of wealth could be created by compounding by finding good businesses investing but uh, you you need capital for that right so i did not know how to do trading uh, so i started and i was already kind of uh, working on stock ideas researching on small mid cap companies for myself and i think at, at least at that point of time uh, there were there were not many small mid cap research focused uh, research outfits 
now there are probably many but at that point of time there were not many so yeah i was already writing blogs and all so i thought i'll start try and monetize it and uh, so i started with this catalyst wealth uh, as it says your catalyst in wealth creation so that's the idea i mean we kind of act as a catalyst in terms of by providing information or good research so which could help people create wealth over longer term and yeah the idea main idea was to uh, generate capital for my own investments frankly because i did not have any source of capital for investing great great yeah janak you can go yeah so so uh, hi kanch uh, janak this mm-hmm. side and uh, i uh, so i had a query regarding your previous uh, pointer that you are making about the information overload and you writing to the companies just wanted to understand ikanch uh, so if an investor a retail investor who is just beginning out or who is quite passionate about it uh, maybe if you can share some nuggets around um, how he can go about uh, scuttle butting and how do companies take it what is a to do list to do? while there is no fixed set of answers i understand but how can one approach this if i really want to do a scuttle but in a micro cap or a small cap that uh, i am invested in so frankly janak i am not w- w- very much of a scuttle but investor i am more of a armchair investor so i mean primarily most of my research is done online yeah obviously there are friends who i talk to then mm-hmm. luckily uh, i mean uh, as i said i go through a lot of annual reports i mean so one should not take this as an investment advice or any kind of recommendation so like there was one company control print i mean i invested 7 8 years back so i almost read 10 15 years or years of annual report of that company because otherwise there was not wasn't much detail available and when i uh, read through those 10 15 years annual report in in at least that case i could get a lot of information because that company was doing a lot of r and d so just reading the r&d bit of that company kind of told me that from being a distributor of a certain company this company every year has been uh, doing its own r&d and developing products which it was earlier acting as a distributor of so this company was moving from distribution to man- own manufacturing so that was like one of the cases where and i read 15 years annual report and i could get much more information so i am not as i said a scuttle but investor i'm more like numbers oriented wherein i if i get good uh, comfort with numbers i'm kind of okay to invest obviously if i able, if i am able to understand the business model per se and how it how things work but yeah if someone is like uh, doing scuttle but i think there are a lot of good investors i think there's value picker forum wherein a lot of uh, people share the contribution by doing scuttle but not just in india there are people who do scuttle but even in say us for certain companies so you could get even though you may not do it yourself but you could get some information with the uh, because other people are doing it and uh, uh, regarding but of lately uh, what has happened is a lot of companies have started responding i mean uh, so even though the company may not be doing uh, investor relations in terms of doing con call or or presentations but if you are an investor and if you write to the cs and if you have done some work in terms of genuine queries which which are like which uh, genuine business related queries and a lot of times probably 8 out of 10 times the management has responded so that has helped me in like making my investment decisions to a certain extent got it i can't got it thank you so much for being uh, so candid about it and guiding over here yes friends uh, thanks i can't yeah thank thanks, you yeah. so mohit uh, you can unmute and uh, if you have any question with from ikansh you can go
you are still on uh, mute you can unmute and ask i i did not request to speak i think uh... okay okay i thought uh, we got your request uh, uh, not a problem uh, you just mute and uh, we'll come to you also mohit so uh, ekansh like uh, how you i mean uh, if we talk about top down approach and bottom up approach so how you go about like you look at the sector first or you directly and uh, as the i mean you told us about the screening criteria on the basis of which uh, you get n number of companies and you do research about those companies how exactly it works for you so uh, i think for me it's more bottom up so like since i have been uh, like researching on companies and running these queries so over a period of time you are also able to kind of uh, develop a watch list so like right now i have a 50 100 stocks 50 stocks plus watch list and it's a watch list that gets developed over a period of 2 3 4 odd years and you may not be necessarily investing in those companies at that point of time but you you are regularly watching them sometimes uh, you you think okay right now it's a good time because the company is going through a bad phase so it's for me it's more bottom up rather than top down but obviously it doesn't mean that i don't look at the sector at all so once i i have like screened for the company so for instance there is say mdf space right i think probably everybody knows i mean this plywood mdf space so i think around 2019 20 we were kind of quite bullish on this segment especially one of the companies so we had found out that okay this company had done a major capex almost 200% capex but because of that 200% capex the company <coughs> had taken too much debt and initially there were some teething issues in terms of improving the capacity utilization there were there was also import of mdf but at the back of our mind we uh, we knew that this segment as such is also growing right now there might be over capacity in india but the segment was growing at 15 20% so there could be one or two odd years of trouble for the company but as the segment was growing it would reach a, a situation where in two years down the line the company would be utilizing its capacity at, at optimum and also there won't be much pressure overall uh, from the overall industry space so yeah you, you i i particularly start as a bottom up investor but then i also look at the segment and the sector overall to determine if there is a good runway ahead or not or if the company what kind of market share the company has in that space and whether it is kind of gaining market share or not so it starts bottom up but one has to look at the segment because you cannot be investing in a segment which in general you cannot be investing in a segment which might be degrowing or which may have like completely saturated because then normally you wouldn't make mon- money over a longer term right ekansh so ekansh like when we talk about global risk inflation risk interest rate and changes in the market cycle war and what not so how how to be i mean really calm in those times and how to track macros or it doesn't matter if we are studying a good business and invested for a longer period of time what do you think on this i think it does matter but uh, it's not easy to really like kind of determine how it would impact so my first suggestion to anybody investing in stock market is invest only that money which you think you won't need for at least 3 4 years or maybe even more so if if you have invested that kind of money you you're probably a patient investor you can wait you can wait through periods of drawdown or wait through periods of uncertainty and it's like for instance there has been a period of uncertainty over the last uh, few months there there's been war then uh, the the way inflation has kind of happened and then uh, the currency movements have happened so obviously these are important but one should not try and uh, try to be too much like predictive about these things but rather be more reflective so uh, you should again inter- think in terms of about your portfolio companies so like there's Uh, too much currency movement happening the while the usd is appreciating against inr but currency is like pound or euro are uh, depreciating so you would have to again look at your uh, portfolio constituents the companies which might be exporting uh, to say us or uk or other european regions then you will have to determine okay how this company is going to impact it similarly then you will have to look at uh, how the company is getting impacted if it's importing raw materials and if it's majorly importing in usd so rather than uh, getting too much uh, i mean like thinking about too much in terms of macro 
look at macros but be reflective about it and look at how those macros are in general kind of impacting your portfolio companies most of the time not all the companies will be impacted obviously something like inflation could impact almost all the companies to a certain extent but that could be transitory so you'll have to look at if you are looking at global data and all the stuff currency demand so look at which all companies are getting impacted and then accordingly take a call on th- on those companies in your portfolio rather than simply thinking too much about okay whether should i be investing or not because in my personal view i think if you have a long runway ahead if you can remain invested for 10 15 years i think it's one should not really be thinking whether this is the best time to invest or the worst time to invest you should have your leg inside the door and you should be invested some amount for me it's like 70 80% is i am invested at all times i could be having some squirrel cash depending on market conditions but being invested is important and reflecting on portfolio companies then thinking too much about war or this or other stuff Oh, right ekansh so ekansh uh, what's your approach to risk management and like when we talk about uh, looking at the downside so how to protect that uh, while investing see i invest in small caps and like i mean sometimes even very very small companies and uh, it ha- does happen that uh, a lot of times i mean if i'm making so first of all i i follow diversification so i have like 15 20 stocks in my portfolio Uh, i am not of the believer of holding just four five stocks at least i am not able to do so so f- 15 20 stocks and in terms of diversification across industries one has to avoid clubbing of risks so like you uh, what could be clubbing of risk is that you might be having companies from different sectors but if they are all majorly exporting to say us then that is a clubbed risk and that is not exactly diversified because if there is some issue in uh, us or if currency movements happen which could negatively impact then it would negatively impact your entire portfolio so diversification means is to avoid clubbing of risks and that could happen both in terms of like looking at the companies are to a certain extent diversified across sectors and also like ge- geographically or that way so and with respect to small mid caps i think one cannot completely avoid drawdowns so i mean there are periods like i think 2018 20 is is the recent period where in small mid caps got butchered and a lot of stocks went down like 40 50 60% <laughs> so you cannot completely avoid that obviously your entire portfolio would not go down 50 60% your portfolio might drop 20 30% and that's part of the game that happens you cannot really completely avoid it i think the only suggestion that i can give and it's it's, it's not exactly it cannot be risk free so only suggestion i can give is that you should try diversification as i said in terms of geographically and sectors and also invest with at least a 3 4 year investment horizon and then you should also look at your personally how you would be able to manage during draw- drawdowns i mean if you have some regular source of income wherein you could add during such drawdowns then there is nothing better than that and but if you if you don't have a regular source of income or regular source of capital addition then you should always try and maintain some cash like 20 or percent 25 30% whatever it is but you should manage that way because not having any liquidity at all kind of makes you panic or makes you take wrong decisions right ekansh so ekansh you must be looking for some special situations and risk arbitra so what you what exactly you look for or where do we find such information so that we get to know that something is happening across any company or so so i think the best source is like daily announcements although now there are tools where and you could simply search for so i mean in terms of special situations we primarily like work on open offers sometimes rights issues delistings demergers so these are the primary category of uh, special situations we work on so and again we don't assume a special situation we act on it after it has been kind of announced so a demerger has been announced or a delisting has been announced or a buyback has been announced we act after it. and all these announcements come uh, first on the exchanges so i think if you are if you if you are an active investor and wish to participate in special situations and all uh Uh, the best sources that you should go uh, you should go through daily corporate announcements uh, on dsc and you'll come across if a company has planned a demerger or if you'll come across where in the promoter has come out with a delisting offer 
the other way could be that you there are again tools i think screener and other uh, wherein you could search or put some notifications or simply search okay what are the day uh, de merger announcements for today or what are the delisting announcements for today so that way you won't have to go through the entire corporate announcements because it is time taking it could take one or two hours of your day especially uh, so you could get notifications about those and then you will have to again like start uh, like researching them these are for instance in de merger you will have to determine what what is the overall timeline right now because it it goes through its own periods of uh, approvals i mean the board of directors approval the shareholders approval the creditors approval uh, the high court approval so it could take almost a year and then in a de merger you would have to de- determine if 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 actual value unlocking is happening or not because these de mergers can act as trigger for value unlocking similarly in delisting you will have to determine what could be the price a promoter might be willing to pay up to so and similarly in buyback offers if you are i mean this buyback thing has become very crowded but of course you could find opportunities where where you will have to define what could be the acceptance ratio and what will be the residual price so the best sources are again the uh, the bsc announcements and and the new tools the websites uh right uh, ikansh so you you talked about buyback so that reminds me of uh, kaveri seeds obviously so uh, not all the time the buybacks are in favor of the investors what do you think about this i mean you have any view over it yeah of course so first of all uh, uh, disclaimer we are invested in kaveri seeds and now again the buybacks are of two types uh, the tender buyback offer and the open market buyback offer so mostly you would get opportunities as a special situation in tender buyback if a company is coming out with an open uh, market buyback it tells you the maximum price at which it would be buying shares but most of the time the prices are below that price and the company would still be buying those shares so it doesn't really create that ar- arbitrage or an opportunity unless the stock is really undervalued and you just buy it because it's undervalued but in in tender buybacks you do all those calculations okay that was the current price what what is the theoretical acceptance ratio what could be the actual acceptance ratio and then you determine the margin of safety depending on so yeah you'll have to first look what kind of buyback it is whether it's a open market buyback or tender buyback because most of the time you would get an opportunity in tender buyback and but again as i said it has become crowded and probably recently if some investors may have participated in some opportunities they may not have made money so one will have to be very selective now because earlier i mean probably 2 3 years out back you could participate in tcs or wipro and forces buy back and still almost 100% shares got accepted in retail category but this doesn't happen now very often all right ikansh so we have uh, one speaker with us so before coming to him like guys i have a small request kindly check the handle of catalyst wealth and ikash mithal and he is sharing great insights with the, all of you so if you guys are finding value you surely can connect him with him and do a follow yeah so anish we's father you can unmute and ask your question from ikash actually mein kya hota hai hum buyback ki aur jab na hum log baat karte hai buyback ki ya you know bonus hi hai split issue ki तो हम उस कंपनी को छह महीने से फॉलो कर रहे होते हैं आज कंपनी ने क्या अनाउंस किया है उसके बेसिस पे हम लोग स्टॉक को सेलेक्ट नहीं कर सकते यूनिटी अंडरस्टैंड वन थिंग हम लोग बाई बैक होता है शेयर्स का बिकॉज आपका आप आप प्योरली फंडामेंटल बेसिस पे जा रहे हो फंडामेंटल बेसिस पे इन सेंस कि कंपनी का प्रॉफिट मार्जिन कितना है मार्जिन कितना है कंपनी के पास कैपिटल कितनी है और कितना एक्सपेंड कर सकती है या फ्यूचर प्लान क्या है सॉरी टू कम इन बिटवीन कैन यू क्विकली आस्क योर क्वेश्चन इन अ क्रिस्ट मैनर मैं सिर्फ एक ही क्वेश्चन पूछता हूँ जब अनाउंसमेंट होता है तब हमको क्यों स्टॉक पे जम्प करना है हम लोग पहले क्यों स्टडी नहीं करते कि कंपनी क्या करने वाली है नहीं यू कुड ऑलवेज स्टडी बट यू आई मीन देर आर फाइव थाउजेंड रजिस्टर्ड कंपनी in in a lot of a lot many see i mean if you are making fundamental investments that's fine and if there is a buyback opportunity you could participate in that opportunity but i am talking about special situations wherein you might not be tracking that company but it could come with a buyback offer and then you participate in that if you like it and if you find the metrics and the margin of safety there agar aapne kisi company mein already invest kiya hua hai usme aa jaye then obviously you can participate depending on how you see the opportunity 
बट आपके पोर्टफोलियो में पंद्रह बीस ही स्टॉक होंगे या वॉच लिस्ट में पचास हंड्रेड स्टॉक्स होंगे उसके अलावा भी कई कंपनीज बाय बैक अनाउंस करती हैं एंड दैट कुड आल्सो गिव यू अ गुड अपॉर्चुनिटी अगर ओवरऑल आपको मार्जिन ऑफ सेफ्टी दिख रही है और आपके कैलकुलेशन के बेसिस में आपको लग रहा है कि एक्सेप्टेंस रेशियो अच्छा हो सकता है राइट एकांश सो एकांश डू यू वांट टू डिस्कस सम केस स्टडीज ऑफ योर बिगर विनर्स और मे बी लूजर्स फ्रॉम विच यू गॉट योर मिस्टेक्स अर्ली मिस्टेक्स और मे बी लर्निंग्स फ्रॉम दोज मिस्टेक्स इफ यू वांट टू शेयर सो आई एम नॉट श्योर बिकॉज आई मीन बिकॉज ऑफ रेगुलेशन इफ वी कैन लाइक सेवी रेगुलेशन एंड रिसर्च एनालिस रेगुलेशन वी कैन डिस्कस स्पेसिफिक केसेज सो can we like avoid stock specific ideas yeah yeah sure uh, that is perfectly understandable so uh, ikansh love coming to a very pertinent question people are often confused about their portfolio construction diversification you already talked about but again how one should go about uh, portfolio construction and what should be the ideal way uh, not exact ideal way to position size uh, our investments See, I think there might be some scientific ways or rules. I do not follow those. I think one, the thing that is important is you will have to first start investing with your money. So I see one problem with a lot of investors is that they read a lot. They are attending, say, I mean, a lot of webinars or whatever. But it's like you have to go out in the field, and when you experience something, that's how you gain some experience and accordingly make adjustments. <laughs> so i never kind of reach this idea 15 20 or pre decided that okay i'll invest in 15 20 stocks but this happened eventually with me that uh, when i'm working on stock ideas i got comfortable with the idea of okay that i'll invest say 4% of my capital when i have invested in a stock stock to begin with eventually i may scale up that stock i may make more investments uh, as i get more information or as i get more conviction or as the company keeps on performing but for me at least it happened organically in terms of uh, wherein i found comfort with holding 15 20 stocks and if you like also look at i mean sports and all a lot of these team sports have these 11 12 12 players in general so i'm not sure I, you cannot really draw any any kind of conclusion from that but frankly for me or it happened quite organically that i found comfort with 15 20 stocks probably my maybe there could be some investors who may be doing so much uh, great research or they may, might be doing so much scuttle but or they would be having uh, uh, they would be having information at the tip of it their uh, hands probably even knowing almost similar to what the promoters they might be comfortable with five or six or eight stock ideas but for me i found, found comfort with 15 20 stocks and here and what happens is that automatically a lot of concentration and diversification happens sometimes your winners become uh, so much bigger over a period of time that even though you might be holding 18 stocks five stocks might be accounting for 60 odd percent of your portfolio so my entry criteria is that i'll invest a 4 odd percent of my capital and then flow with the go with the flow in terms of like adding more if the company is performing or if i am getting more conviction or if the stock in itself becomes bigger and starts accounting for a larger part of portfolio but i think in general yeah 15 20 at least to me it seems like it's a good diversification strategy yeah janak you can go next yeah yeah so ekansh i had a, a very uh, uh, curious uh, curiosity over here so first wanted to understand what is the highest allocation that you give to a stock at what extreme levels uh, it has gone in your uh, history of investing one and second uh, uh, slightly more uh, f- uh, follow on question to your thought process say for instance if you start with a 5% allocation and it turns out to be a multi bagger uh, in due course it becomes four times five times or maybe six seven eight times then the allocation skyrockets to say 20 25 30% in that case how does an investor handle uh, this does he look to rebalance does he look to book profits the assumption is there is still a huge runaway for growth so these were my uh, uh, two bits over here and maybe if you can help so yeah my f- biggest allocation probably i think i made way back in 2011 so firstly i mean the portfolio size was very small so in 2011 odd and frankly somehow I, uh, again this is not a recommendation I, and i currently do not own that stock and that stock was sera sanitaryware 
So, I think in 2010 or 11, I think it was around 160, 180, and I found, I mean, it almost kind of ticked all the things for me. I mean, good consistent growth. Somehow, I, I found too much connect with their product line in terms of I thought, okay, this industry is growing, going to grow too much. It it it, it because uh, the residential demand was improving. People used to have one washroom in their homes, and then they were having three, four. from joint families to nuclear families and this company was consistently growing 20 odd percent 25 watt percent and then i also found a letter by the promoters to the sebi asking uh, that they would be making some creeping accusations so they wanted a clarification so i mean it kind of ticked all the all the things uh, it had a good balance sheet and and now you would not find these stocks at 8 10 times but in 2010 11 these stocks even then they were reporting very good earnings and everything and they were available at eight times earnings so that's when i had the guts and maybe because the portfolio size was also small that's why i could make probably 15 or percent allocation then i it doesn't happen with me now at least i haven't found a, an idea with wherein i could get similar conviction and at very low valuations or reasonable valuations now regarding the second question Yeah, so it has happened wherein a stock has become. Uh, I started with four five percent allocation as stock went up five x ten x or whatever. Yeah, so and normally when it starts growing beyond twenty odd percent, uh, so I start reviewing it much more, uh, and uh, I I start looking out for signs if there are signs for topping out of earnings or not because a lot of times it happens that. Uh, when the stock has already run up so much and a 5% has become a 20 odd percent one has to also take into account the fact that the other stock portfolio might have also been growing so a 5% becoming 20% means that it has compounded at a very very fast pace or it has grown too much in a very in comparison to others so there and i start becoming a bit cautious or i start looking for signs if, if there are signs for earnings stopping or not or if the valuations are extremely uh, high or not because beyond 20% in a single stock i would be a bit cautious and uh, i mean although there are people who would say that okay i mean one could uh, even at 30% is good and you let your winners compound so i'm not really thinking of uh, stopping the compounding of that winner but i'll be cautious and looking for signs if there are signs for overvaluation or earnings stopping out in that case i would start reducing if i see signs of stopping out of earnings got it again so basically the uh, the take away here is it is better to look at rebalancing and then being cautious about it then uh, yeah, losing percent for a single stock that way i mean surely you cannot just leave it and become overconfident and think okay this has been because it happens with a lot of investors even with me that once a stock has like de- delivered so much returns you tend you start tend to start becoming overconfident about it and start loving the story so much so i mean at the back of the mind you should start becoming cautious as well in my in my view and start looking out for signs it could be like a lot of times see there are very few exceptional companies which have been able to like keep on growing their sales and earnings year on year it doesn't happen very often i mean one would although one would start looking for terms like moats or competitive advantages but a lot of times those are not sustainable and you don't want to be in that scenario where everything is looking very good and suddenly things start collapsing because the margins may have expanded too much and they may not be sustainable they may 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 have been too much earnings growth or sales growth and that may not be sustainable so one has to be cautious and start looking for and be more vigilant vigilant about those investments because 20% anyways for a single stock is not less so it's okay to be more vigilant than being too much in love with the stock got it ekant thank you so much for uh, clarifying it thanks yeah. so we have uh, gorav with us gorav you can unmute and ask your question <clears throat> thanks thanks prince for hosting this and uh, thanks akash for akash for sharing your insights so i think i, I was listening to this call and uh, i think uh, uh, really incredible journey for you so just wanted to understand like how did you uh, because when you would have started i think there are so many sectors in the market and everyone has their own nuances so how did you build up your sector specific knowledge and uh, how you are still doing that i mean because uh, as new things keep on coming up i think uh, while something which you said that annual reports are a good source but are there some of the source available outside that something which has really worked for you thanks 
so uh, i think you asked about how i i kind of built up my so could you just like uh, repeat the question again i mean yeah so the i was uh, how do you uh, build up your insights uh, sector specific insights because uh, uh each sector is quite different uh, so like for example uh, when you would have started i'm just guessing uh, suppose you are not so much sure on the pharma sector or a chemical sector so beyond an annual reports did something help you to uh, increase your knowledge on that front yeah so for instance the pharma sector i mean frankly it takes a lot of time in certain sectors i mean there are certain products and companies wherein you are able to get a feel of it and those are easy but for instance you as you mentioned about pharma or say chemicals i mean these are very wide sectors or even for instance banking and bfcs i mean there are a whole lot of different companies and there are so many product categories like even within pharma there is api there is formulations there are companies which are making intermediates and there are companies to cdmo so if you so as i mentioned i'm a bottom sub uh, stock picker so for instance if i have started liking a company which is into api so therein i start reading too much about it the overall sector and again uh, i mean you have to just keep uh, i'm more of an armchair investor so i search on it uh, about it on internet go through various forums go through various uh, brokerage reports so frankly one may, uh, one may not take investment ideas from brokerage reports but you could get a lot of information about the sector or the company itself from those brokerage reports because uh, they have their good resources and they have their good information about the industry so i read read a lot of lot of these brokerage reports similarly one could also read a lot of these credit rating reports where wherein you could get a lot of information again about to a certain extent about the sector but also about the company so it does take a lot of reading and it does not necessarily happen that you get comfortable with the sector just as you are researching on the company it could take like several months or one or two odd years and that's how you even get hang of the cycle of the industry okay how uh, who are the competitors where where the major raw material sourcing is happening from where you are actually selling uh, most of the products so like in chemicals it's such a wide sector wherein there are companies which are making a, a, it it could be in to fluorine chemistry some could be in other segment so every sector takes a lot of reading and i think you'll have to read both through annual reports in annual reports frankly you won't get much information about the sector unless the company discusses in the uh, in the presentations but you also can go through a lot of those con calls you you may not necessarily like i mean hearing the concourse states too much time but if uh, there are like tools again like ticker and all wherein you can get all the concourse transcripts so i would suggest reading a lot of these concourse transcripts because sometimes in in companies sometimes good managements really explain you well the overall sector or how or how the overall sector works what are the various moving parts so again it's reading across across stuff from annual reports to con call transcripts to presentations to various forums that's how you eventually like kind of build up the knowledge about the sector and again it depends on individual there are certain uh, people who are like almost experts on a particular segment like they could be experts on cement or pharma or financial but i am not exactly i do not uh, work in that way wherein i am trying to become an expert on that sector it's again more of a holistic view than a very very fine view on that sector thanks 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 akash for sharing this thank you ma'am so uh, we have uh, one question from charanjeev singh so basically two question first question is how you analyze uh, management quality so key pointers to go and no go so this is question number 1 so management quality uh again it's kind of challenging in small cap companies uh, so uh, because uh, these are not perfect companies and i think one has to again determine and it happens over a period of investing you kind of determine what works for you what may not work for you so i have seen a lot of investors simply like pointed out pointing out red flags if there is a related party transaction a certain investor would point out it as a red flag and say i won't invest in that company so frankly it doesn't work for me that way I, uh, what i look for is the overall history of the company 5 10 years operating performance how they have gone about capital allocation uh, what has been the growth and overall and 
I also look for the skin in the game. So I'm not comfortable, especially in small caps, owning owning companies wherein the the promoters have only say thirty five or just say below forty percent. I'm more comfortable owning where the promoters have say more than fifty percent stake in the in the company. And and I'm also looking at other things like if they have a company uh, of their if they are fully devoted to to this company in terms of the sector they are operating in. if they have too many other companies which might be in similar line of business and a lot of times you could get information about those companies as well through corporate filings then you would avoid those companies because then the management's attention is divided but as as primarily the skin in the game is important you look at capital allocation if they haven't done really major bad things and what i mean by capital allocation is if they are frequent if they have been diluting their equity very frequently i would avoid those companies similarly the management has been making too many acquisitions i would kind of in general avoid those companies so if the com- management hasn't diluted equity or very minimal dil- equity dilution the growth has been good they have good high promoter holding i'm kind of okay investing in those companies even if they have say slightly higher remuneration or even if uh, 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 the related par- party transactions are to a certain extent on the higher side i am kind of okay investing in those companies uh right kanch so another question is uh, like sector specific he is asking any view if you have on uh, textile sector no oh, nothing in particular right now i mean i think we only yeah. have one stock under coverage which is from the inner wear segment so but otherwise no particular view on text well i think i am reading a lot about these uh, free trade agreement that might happen with uk and other countries so it might be beneficial for india but again it's a wide sector it depends on what kind of textile textiles you are looking at what kind of exports whether export oriented or whether home furnishing related or whether a yarn company or what so difficult to ha- say any particular view all right so one question is uh, how you prepare yourself for beer market so that is one and the cash portion of the question you already have covered yeah. how do you prepare i think prepare beer markets have happen over a period of time 2018 20 was a major beer market for us i mean the small caps got butchered and everything so i think the only way you can prepare is first of all having patient capital i mean by patient capital is like investing only that sum which you can remain invested for 3 4 years otherwise i mean no, bear market doesn't come and tell you in advance okay the bear market is coming and now you have to prepare for it so it the drawdowns happen the market corrections keep on happening they could extend for 6 months 1 year 2 years and i think one has to keep like looking at and uh, like keep researching on the portfolio as well a bear market doesn't mean that you don't do anything at all or you just keep on adding to your existing stocks if you if you research more you are turning more raws you may find better opportunities or you 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 may find that certain stocks which might be good in your portfolio at say before this bear market hit they may may not be good right now because the uh, overall the conditions may have changed and they may not be suitable so you churn the portfolio in that way by looking for better opportunities and once you are doing that stuff and researching eventually you kind of get over with these bear markets it's all about like being comfortable with your portfolio what stocks you are holding and you have to keep like determining if if things that you are holding they could do well over the next 3 4 years or not if if you are getting that comfort it's normally you're you're quite you're normally able to like pass through bear markets i am normally more concerned when i have some issues with the company in the uh, that i have in the portfolio where i am not sure or where i see signs of topping out that's where i more i am probably more anxious and trying to determine what should be my next course of action whether i should be selling that company or not or changing that or switching over to some other company or not that makes me more anxious overall Uh, right so devesh <coughs> sorry devesh you can unmute and ask thanks prince sir for the opportunity uh, sir my question is like um, i am a young investor and i have a similar uh, career path as you had like um, i started my journey in college second year i also have done electronics uh, bachelor's in engineering in electronics and communication so sir uh, initially the stock market journey was not a successful one for me and i had 
some bad experiences in small cap na- small cap names like leel and madhukon the initial learning curve like like everyone has it was pretty bad so sir after 2 uh, to 3 years in ba- in the market um, i got successful but uh, i due to the initial unsuccessful journey in the small and micro caps i was a bit hesitant to participate in any other ideas like that so now i think 3 to 4000 crores market cap company is quite suitable where the promoter is uh, actively participating in con calls every quarter the company has holds con call and everything so but sir um, how are you able to build the trust with a like if the market cap is 200 crore rupees and then uh, the stock went went up four to five times like 800000 crore then uh, mostly in the space the small cap space the promoters are not willing to give it to the shareholders like give the value to the shareholders then how are you able to spot that I mean, frankly, if a 200 crore market cap company has become 800,000 crore market cap company, you have already made 4x, 5x. No, sir, but uh, that doesn't happen. Nah. That's the thing. Like, with uh, with a, like, 3 to 4,000 crore, crore market cap already, like, if you are buying a company which is trading at 3,000 crore market cap and it has been in the market for, th- uh, like, 10 to 12 years, then you can trust the management that he will not... Uh, no, no, so... Uh, See, frankly, one doesn't really have to think too much in terms of market cap. I think this large cap, cap I mean, one doesn't really have, if you're researching on company, if you're working on company, if you're finding certain patterns with respect to numbers, or if you have done some work, it could be a 200 crore company that might be good for investment. And similarly, you have so many cases of 50,000 odd crore company or 20,000 odd crore company that have gone bust and, and have like lost complete value for the shareholders. So it's never about whether it's a 200 crore company or a 3000 odd crore company. So 3000 odd crore company will only create value and 200 odd crore market cap company will not. I think what happens, see, you mentioned something about Leel or whatever. So I don't exactly know what happened, but I think you probably did not research them enough. And you probably made investments based on, based on probably hearing the stock, uh, getting this uh, stock idea from somewhere. If you had done your work, maybe done your fundamental research, probably you may not have invested in that stock. So firstly, you will have to determine for yourself whether on what basis you are buying the stock, whether you have actually done the research or it's just an act of research wherein you have just gotten the stock idea from someone and read some articles and thought you have done your research. No, you will have to you have to determine for yourself what are the patterns and numbers that you are looking for. So for me, it's important because as I said, I'm a bottoms up stock picker. Okay. So I'm running screens. So I have certain patterns of financial numbers in my mind that I'm looking at. So when I said a cyclical stock, so if you are going to buy a cyclical stock near earnings peak or when the earnings are extremely good, Eventually, you won't make any money. You would rather lose 70-80% of your uh, portfolio, stock value over the next 2-3 years. At least that's what happened. But if I have seen that pattern and if I'm investing when the earnings are really bad, really bad in sense when the operating margins are really low in terms of the average operating margins, the entire the commodity prices are down and the capacity utilizations are low, no new capacity is coming up, I could end up making 4x on that same stock. So everyone would have a different experience. Similarly, the pattern for good companies going through bad phase could be those might be moderately cyclical and you're investing not when everything is good, but when there's a slowdown in demand, when the earnings growth or, or the sales growth has been slow, or in fact, there has been a drop in sales and the margins have collapsed even, even higher from say 15 odd percent to 10, 12 odd percent. So it, it, it doesn't mean that it's a bad company. It's just that it's going through a slowdown phase. And because the markets react in a even a, in a in a bigger manner, so while the earnings drop might be twenty percent, the stock fall could be 40 fifty percent because earlier the market was valuing it at its peak earnings and there was market frenzy. Now the earnings have come down and there's overall uh, the markets do not like it the sector at all. So you'll have to determine and form your patterns about numbers if you're investing that way and not really think of whether it's a 200 crore company or 4000 crore company i have frankly seen so many 100 200 or 50 or 300 odd crore company or 500 odd crore company which have made so much money for investors 
So and similarly, a three thousand odd crore company has made money for investors, but there are also a lot of three thousand odd crore companies that have lost money for investors. So you should be focusing on the numbers and the research part rather than what the market cap is. Unless, of course, your portfolio size is so big that you cannot really. For the, obviously, there are some very large investors who cannot really invest in a two hundred crore company because of liquidity issues. Uh, right, Ekansh. So, Ekansh, uh, I mean, which are uh, two three sectors you feel uh, ought to do good uh, in next th- three to five years? Difficult to say. I mean, recently we are looking at this API space again, uh, pharma API space again. So. Uh, this sector it had done quite well in 2020 2021 there was shortage of apis the prices of apis went up too high uh, the, the countries were overstocking and now the it's completely reverse in the sense that because there was overstocking now the uh, the demand has kind of fallen off the raw material prices are on the higher side while the the overall end product prices have come down a bit and the stock prices are also down 50 60% from 2020 2021 not levels so I think the pharma API looks good for the next few years. Uh, uh, there are certain stocks in the innerwear segment that we are liking. The seed companies, it looks like they could do well. Uh, similarly, the in the financial space, it looks like uh, the NBFCs they could do well. I mean, a lot of these com- uh, the uh, gold loan companies or NBFCs because uh, recently there was too much competition. I think that may kind of go down. Their microfinance outfits were not doing well for the past few years, and the valuations look extremely cheap for them. So these NBFCs, the gold loan outfits with microfinance, could do well. Their pharma API space could do well. Right, Ekansh. So we have uh, Ankit from SmartSync Services. Ankit, uh, you can unmute and uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, Ankit. Thanks and. Uh... i just joined uh, i don't know if anyone has a- already asked this question uh, before asking that question i like the work uh, catalyst wealth and ikansh uh, are doing uh, i somehow uh, i think i if i remember correctly in one of your tweets you mentioned about technicals so i have never used technicals so i just wanted to understand uh, how much importance do you give to technicals in your investment thesis and uh, how it has helped you i think that would be great Uh, so hi Ankit, uh, thank you for your kind appreciation. Uh, regarding technicals, I think uh, it's not something a very major part about uh, overall investing. Uh, but yeah, I have started looking at it. I I found this book, uh, Trade Like a Champion, by Mark Minervini Good. And frankly, I mean, if you are using tools, for instance, Screener, over the last few years they added stock price charts. So what was happening was I am screening for so many companies. Like I am looking. When I uh, when I run screeners, I get hundred odd stocks, and I'm screening ten odd stocks every day. So when I'm screening those stocks, I also get to look those stock price charts, and then I tend to spend some time as well, like a few minutes, and also look at their one, two, three years, or five years, or ten years price chart. So as I said, I this cyclical thing. Earlier, I did not believe it much, but now. If you see, except for a few exceptional businesses, I mean, you could count them on your fingertips. Almost all the businesses are cyclical. So earlier, I did not used to participate in these cyclical businesses. But when I looked at the stock price charts, wherein they went up four x, five x, or ten x in two three year period, and then I found that they also went down seventy eighty percent during bad periods. And this was this was a cyclical pattern. And then I also looked at their uh, profit and loss numbers for ten years, and I also found a cyclical pattern. so the charts held me in that way in terms of determining okay when the stocks are really have corrected too much along with earnings collapse i could start finding opportunities that way similarly i would say even though i have not been able to incorporate it or practice it completely i think selling at the time of selling because see buying is an easier decision in general you won't find much uh, uh content regarding how to go about selling stocks and that is also quite important because as i said a lot of businesses are cyclical they could be moderately cyclical or extremely cyclical so but what happens is if you are just a value investor a lot of times even this valuation aspect is subjective i mean we have seen stocks 
uh, getting re-rated from 10 times earnings to 20 times earnings to 50 times and 100 100 times earnings and this is a subjective part regarding valuations so a lot of times what happens is as a value investor or fundamental analyst you find that probably the earnings are topping out or you are not comfortable really adding the stock or you are, may also be considering selling the stock so i think in those cases probably technical technical analysis or chart patterns could prove to be helpful so you may not exactly say okay this stock is overvalued and i'll sell it just now maybe based on chart pattern you could think okay if it goes below certain level i'll sell it so you could have some profit protection strategy based on those chart patterns and all so i think this ch- chart patterns or technicals could prove to be helpful even to value investors at the time of selling similarly if you read about this uh, mark minervini book that i uh, that uh, that i am referring to trade like a champion i think one important pattern that everyone should know is that this he has talked about four four phases step 1 uh, step 2 step 3 step 4 if i am if i remember it correctly so step 1 is like normally consolidation step 2 is when the stock is going through a growth phase step 3 is when it's going through a distribution phase and step 4 is collapse and we have seen this happen with a lot of stocks i mean uh, where uh, the industry peaked out earnings peaked out and then the stocks go through a complete collapse almost like 50 60% 70 80% kind of collapse so when you see these patterns you kind of become more aware and maybe you could try and incorporate those things in your overall investment even as a value investor so i think on the selling front it could prove to be very helpful and i am trying to at least work more on that and improve our selling because as value investors we t- t- uh, we tend to get more uh, we tend to fall in love with certain stocks while a lot of times that mo- may not be the good thing uh, because the earnings may peak out or the industry may peak out and there could be a complete collapse in earnings and for that company thanks that really helped just just to understand it uh, even more uh, maybe i am over simplifying but just for the sake of example say for example you buy a stock at say 15 times uh, earnings and uh, Uh, as per your four stages if it is in the growth stage even if you see that the valuation is say 30 times or 40 times earnings but if uh, as per the chart patterns if you think that the gro- it is still in the growth phase you will continue to hold and uh, probably add or you would uh, what would be your reaction in that sense i may not necessarily add i mean it could depend on, on the strategy that i may be following i may i'll probably continue holding and will probably have some profit protection strategy if you could call it stop loss or maybe based on that chart pattern where you see a breakdown kind of a thing i would have some stop loss kind of a strategy if i am not comfortable with valuations or if i see that the earnings might be topping out see for instance it happens in metal companies right so two years back they were reporting very bad earnings very bad operating margins like 8 10 odd percent operating margins for say chrome allo- alloys business now around a year back their operating margins had gone up to 30 odd percent 35 odd percent with uh, because the prices of uh, the end product prices had also gone up and their pat improved 3x 4x so you you see, you are seeing signs of topping out in terms of earnings but the stock seems in momentum or in or in that growth phase the step 2 or the so you may continue holding but at the same time you may have some profit protection strategy it could be a trailing stop loss and i have kind of ridden one or two stocks that way wherein if i was purely following fundamental or value strategy i would have sold it at that point of time but following a trailing stop loss strategy worked wherein i could sell at 20 30% higher price got it thank you thank you so much akansh so akansh uh, let me ask you how good we are on time because it's actually one and a half hour so are you comfortable of for a few more questions or shall we wrap it up <coughs> so we can continue i mean if you are, if you guys are comfortable and okay. there are some we have all the questions for you so uh, <clears throat> see mistakes uh, are a part and parcel of the market journey so would you like to talk about your um, mistakes maybe in the initial years and we all continue to do mistakes uh, throughout our uh, market journey so would you like to talk about that yeah so i mean mistakes i would say if one has been has been both of commission and omission so 
I feel like these omission mistakes are much bigger because commission mistakes wherein you buy a stock and if you are doing some decent level of research maybe you would get a bad stock and it would go down 50 odd percent 40 odd percent right you lost money i as i said in start with 4% allocation so okay i lost 2 odd percent that way but i i feel there have been more errors of omission wherein there were certain stock ideas i i was lethargic about or i i had a preconceived notion like say uh, in my earlier years I, i used to ignore these cyclical stocks right and as i said if if one works on those and i think there are some really good investors as well who have practiced investing in cyclical stocks one could get 3x 4x 5x in two years time frame so that was one error of omission i would say when i was not aware too much about or i had a preconceived notion about not investing in cyclical stocks and similarly i mean i remember like when i invested in sera at that around the same time there was another company astral polytechnic i think th- th- there was loads of research even my friends were investing somehow for some reason i kind of i did not invest in that stock and it has done phenomenally well even better than sera uh, just to add i am not i do not hold any of the two stocks and just mentioning it for reference so it's, it's been more of a omission wherein i was kind of like maybe did not put in too much effort in terms of researching that stock or had some thought process and yeah so those have been bigger mistakes but even on the commission side uh like recently we were extremely bullish on one company which was in the mdf space so i would just name it green panel we had done extreme research we had done very good research we had the complete thought process that okay now complete is in and this is about 2019 20 so the company was in trouble because it had a major expansion and it had a major debt but we thought that this is probably the bottom of it and things would only start improving because the capacity utilization would improve the company would start repaying debt and uh, we were very confident about it but suddenly the covid struck and we panicked because the the investment thesis changed because of covid 19 uh the company's plants were shut the company could not operate and while in normal operating conditions it could have started paying off debt here in it was a completely different scenario and remember in march 2020 or april 2020 we were not even sure how things will work out i mean now two years later we know okay things did not turn out that bad but in march 2020 being in a march 2020 scenario you were not sure because the company's plants were shut or shut down and they had so much debt and we ran it and we sold off and since then the stock has gone up almost like 20x so that was probably one error of commission as well so yeah there have been several mistakes and frankly no matter how much i try and improve it, if i make 10 investments two or three still go wrong all right right so one of the attendees kushal is unable to send his speaker request so if he is listening us kindly write your question in the comments so that i can take that up with ekansh so ekansh like uh, when it comes to different asset classes so what's your allocation or uh, you are simply uh, invested in equities only yeah almost 90 95% equities some some like yeah uh, the other 5 odd percent and odd percent is for emergency purpose or like almost like two years out of for expenses and which i may use in very bad market conditions out of those two year expenses i may use one year for in when the markets are extremely down for investing but yeah almost 90 95% is equity all right so uh, who are your uh, investing idols uh, which you think have uh, what we say have a great impact on your investing style or maybe you learned a considerable uh, amount of things from them so i would say we we learned a lot from professor bakshi because earlier as i mentioned we used to simply look at we did not really know the we knew the numbers but we did not really know how to correlate those numbers the ROE, ROCs, and how to correlate the numbers or how to look at those numbers deeply. But I think somewhere around 2010 or 2011, or he was writing so much on his blogs, and he was sharing so much. He 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 explained this concept of float so beautifully. 
the concept of working capital how even negative working capital could be good for businesses so at least his writings helped me understand the numbers part a lot similarly i mean in terms of i, I like the fact that there are investors like ashish kacholia ji vijay kedia ji who who have done so much i hope i am able to reach even uh, attain some of it what they have done so like these guys have almost like 100000 odd crore portfolios 2000 odd crore and they they have been active equity investors they have been investing in small caps i mean if you still see their portfolio you still see them on the con calls asking the questions understanding the business and obviously luck matters i mean but even then without like they have they have created so much wealth so i mean those are my idols because they have created so much wealth by investing in these small and mid cap companies which i hope to kind of emulate uh ikansh when it comes to uh, counting we see a lot of uh, financial shenanigans so do you uh, i mean uh, are there any red flags or pointers which we can as a retail investor who is not much into research can identify uh, so that would be really helpful see for red flags i think you would have to do deeper research so i mean i mean just for beginning uh, as a beginner you could avoid companies where there might be promoters uh, placed or there might be companies which are doing constant equity dilution like regularly raising funds either through qip through preferential allotments or allotments to promoters then you could also avoid companies simply i mean if you have to just look at very simply then you could avoid companies which are making too many acquisitions because these kind of tell you that okay the company isn't able to manage from its own resources own funds and is probably trying to do these acquisitions so as to kind of mask uh the fact that they are not able to grow organically but for for real like i mean i mean the kind of stuff uh, that say someone like nitin mangal does like the forensic and he really points out the red flags which are not even like kind of can be gauged by even those who do research one has to do do very deep research and one could also look at these things like uh, the working capital cycle of the company if it's expanding too much like receivable days are in, expanding too much one should get cautious so these are the normal regular red flags that one could look at all uh, right so uh, ikansh when it comes to debt people have a perception if a company is having that uh, debt so that is bad so is it the bad all the times or what's the holistic view like uh, regarding the debt and how we should uh, uh, i mean if we take a screening criteria say debt to equity what should be the ideal range which we should con- consider now obviously this, this would be different for different sectors but again holistically what is the best way to uh, see it no so frankly again if you are doing research it cannot be a, a, a very fixed range because i mean earlier even i used to think that okay i won't invest in any company which has too much debt but now Uh, over a period of time you realize that in fact you could get one uh, best investment sometimes best investment opportunities where the company might be having debt but at the same time you will have to also think and research whether that debt is the peak debt for the company or not and if it starts repaying that and if that uh, debt starts going down on absolute basis uh and relative basis to equity you could have a huge multi bagger because what happens is when the company has huge debt on its balance sheet the overall enterprise value for instance if it has say 200 crore market cap or say 300 crore market cap and 700 crore debt and the market may not be giving it much value but now if you see that okay the debt has peaked out the company has carried out all the major expansion and it will start repaying debt this debt as it start getting repaid the overall perception of the company starts changing and as the debt starts getting repaid the interest payment starts going down and this will have a a positive impact on the earnings and assuming even now that this uh, enterprise value remains same which although it may not remain same because as the earnings are growing the enterprise value may change and the market cap may increase because the market may start seeing it positively assuming it remains same now the 700 crore debt becomes 200 crore 
while the earlier market cap 300 crore becomes 800 crore so you have already a good gainer a company wherein you have made good returns but as i said it it doesn't remain same because the earnings have started expanding the market perception changes its debt equity has started reducing and this overall market cap of the company may become say 2000 crore and you you will have a multi bagger on hand so debt in general i mean you if you are starting your investment journey you should obviously be looking at companies in low debt and all that but smarter investors have made money even in those companies where there has been a lot of debt and if they are seeing signs of that going down so yeah initially you could start with companies which might be having say debt to equity ratio less than 1 or 0.5 but that is not exactly a, a, a very fixed formula for where in uk say you can say that okay it will deliver you good returns you will have to again find out what's happening on the overall balance side bal- balance sheet side yeah right ekansh so ekansh i would also request uh, you to tell what offerings uh, do you have at catalyst well so that at least uh, those who are interested can reach out not from the sales point of view but again uh, holistically what research you are uh, doing and what all offerings you have at catalyst wealth i think it would seem like a sales pitch but anyways i mean we have been doing this for like 11 years with this catalyst wealth and we are primarily focused on small mid cap companies and again the primary focus is on long medium term investment for wealth creation so earlier frankly when we had a smaller subscriber base we could even recommend 100 200 or crore market cap companies but now that has kind of slightly increased from say to say 500 odd crore market cap companies to 5000 odd crore in general there are also companies where in we uh, with a market cap of 10000 crore which we have recommended but on an average the size is 500 to 5000 and yeah i mean this is the basic offering i mean for someone who it might be a good option if if you are a direct if you are investing directly into equities and looking for some research in the small mid cap space great great so we have another speaker with us uh, pradeep uh, you can quickly unmute and ask your uh, question yeah yeah thanks prince uh, uh, thanks akansh uh, for taking this question so this is more related to the portfolio allocation for example assume that um, you have a belief in a company which is debt free and great management you have disproportionately allocated at the start of the journey and currently that stock is like close to 50% of my portfolio and, I, and there is a long runway for growth so in those cases i mean sometimes you get jittery about it right with the allocation side so what what should we do in those uh, cases uh, what can go wrong kind of thing yeah thank you i think a lot of a lot of things can go wrong uh, i think you mentioned about 50% allocation so frankly i have never made that kind of allocation as i said i mean in the past uh, during this call that the maximum that i allocated and that 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 was a time when the portfolio was small so probably started at this 15% so i think anyways if you're if you're getting jittery too much or if you're not able to sleep i think you should reduce the allocation to a point where you are able to sleep comfortably and see i mean 50 odd percent is something i have never done and frankly i i think it i would not even suggest doing that way although it, it it's again completely up to an individual based on the research he has done or whatever but yeah uh, i mean 50% is too much for me <laughs> at least uh, based on my investing style see i am not the promoter a lot of things could go wrong and frankly when i am in, uh, investing 15 20 stocks i am also kind of opening myself to good luck so if if i'm doing reasonable research reasonably good research and if i'm investing 15 20 stocks or maybe somewhat more i mean you never know what tailwind could happen for a certain sector or some something really good could happen in a certain company so you are opening yourself to good uh, positive luck, luck happening or good uh, good luck happening to you while when you are investing say 50% something could happen say a covid 19 could happen and maybe your stock was one of the uh, had one of the best opportunities but things turned really bad because of covid 19 and now it may not have the best opportunity so yeah i think it opens to like i mean bad luck as well so for me it's more about being comfortable and being able to sleep at night well because anyways i'm like 90 95% invested in equities so i think this 50% allocation to one stock would also depend on 
what is your overall asset allocation if it's low asset allocation like you have other assets like real estate or gold or whatever fixed then you might be okay doing 50% but when I, at least for me personally when i'm investing 90 to 95% i'm okay with 15 20 stock idea or some things like yeah thanks thanks uh, i can't i have other investments as well equity is a small portion so yeah thank you yeah so i think that then it makes sense probably Thank you, Pradeep. So, Ekansh, uh, one last question for the day. Like one book you already have recommended. Any other book recommendations uh, which you feel uh, would be really helpful for our audiences? I think one book which really proved to be helpful for me was this book, The Most Important Things Illuminated by Howard Marks. So, I think one has read all these books like Intelligent Investor and all that stuff. But to develop that... Uh, it kind of develops your psychology for investing in stock market it tells you that things go bad things are cyclical markets go down markets also go through a phase of like huge exuberance so it kind of really if you read it a few times you kind of develop this okay and you you understand the functioning of the market you understand the cyclicality of things you understand that businesses are cyclical the markets are hugely cyclical so it kind of prepares you to deal with the, with these drawdowns bear market and also look at them as opportunities so that kind of helped, really helped me a lot the most important thing eliminated by howard marks uh, even uh, that is uh, my favorite book as well <laughs> so uh, mm-hmm. uh, ekansh we got one more speaker so he'll be last for today sorry for extending it so akhil you can quickly unmute and ask your question quickly yeah yes uh, hello ekansh <clears throat> hi akhil yes uh, <clears throat> uh can we do uh, i mean i don't know how to can we do swing trading uh, for a long run uh, as a trading strategy uh, within the span of 2 3 months not like a year or two is it possible so i think it might be possible but I, frankly i'm not the right person to answer that uh, so i think there might be other better people who are practicing this swing trading or whatever momentum trading so those might be better people to answer that i am not the right person Uh, right right ikansh so ikansh uh, first of all i thank you so much for agreeing to our uh, demand for coming today and it was a great session i must say and it was really insightful from your end sharing uh, so much of information candidly and uh, seriously we really liked your uh, <coughs> engagement today and guys uh, <coughs> i mean you have been listening to this podcast for last 90 minutes so it's your responsibility do check the handle and you will for sure you will find quality content and if you like it do give a follow to ekansh mittal and surely would uh, like to have a second round of uh, this insightful journey sometime down the line so ekansh uh, any concluding remarks from your end firstly again apologies for 10 minutes delay i mean uh, this was all, this was my first twitter spaces and i did not have the twitter app on my phone so apologies for that and secondly i mean i just hope that whatever spoke or whatever we discussed i hope it was to a certain extent helpful for all the listeners out here i hope the time did not get wasted much <laughs> listening to this so yeah And yeah thanks, thank you thanks, thanks for the opportunity i mean as i said this was my first twitter spaces so thanks for the opportunity uh, i have frankly enjoyed sharing thank you ikansh and i can't like i have been doing this thing from last 4 5 months and i have been requesting learned people so that uh, we get a touch and feel of their thought process so that we can uh, take that as a starting point and do our own due diligence so it was really nice to have you and again this session is recorded and any names uh, taken during the conversations were purely educational or maybe for illustration so please do not uh, do any kind of buy sell uh, recommend uh, buy sell thing on the basis of this podcast uh, this is purely educational and no sort of commercials are involved from any end and uh, we are doing this in good faith so as to create an ecosystem to learn from each other 
so thank you so much once again and i'll be putting this podcast over my youtube channel as well so those who missed it they can uh, anyway revisit uh, the insightful session with ekansh so ekansh thank you again and good night for today <coughs> thank you brain science a lot and we have already mentioned the disclaimer part so that's important yeah Don't, janak janak like sorry i missed yeah janak you have anything to say to janak uh, sorry ekans no no one of the cleanest uh, thought processes and discussions that i have heard in a long long time ekans really loved the insights and discussions that you uh, gave today and really happy to have been sharing the forum with you so thanks for your time and thank you for taking our uh, taking at least my primitive questions thanks no, thank once again you. thanks a lot janak thanks for the opportunity great okay. great janak and guys if you are liking my spaces do follow my channel as well so that i get the necessary motivation so as to bring more learned people for a uh, mutual learning and thank you again good night over <coughs>